Okay, so uh, welcome to the Eastline Board of Education meeting for April 5th, uh, 2021. Uh, we called the meeting to order at five o'clock and immediately went into executive session for the purpose of discussing, uh, for discussion concerning attorney-client communication related to diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, including the Equity Init uh, Institute uh, District Audit. And the second item was the proposed appointments for 12-month assistant principals at the East Lyme High School and at the East, East Lyme Middle School. Uh, we have come out of executive session and we are still uh, in uh, uh, order. And for that, uh, I'd like to uh, ask everyone who can rise, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay. So uh, apologies. Um, we are having some technical issues. I hope everybody will be able to hear us um, uh, with our uh, system here. So uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, weather through. And, and Jill, since you're the one board member that's uh, online, if, if something fails or whatever, try to get our attention. <laughs> so, okay. So we'll do, I'll let you know if something falls through. Yeah, thanks, Jill. So public comment. Um, we have uh, two public comments that were submitted um, to the board. The first one is from Carter Chambers. Uh, it uh, is um, as follows. Dear Mr. Newton, I'm a player for the East Lime uh, baseball team. And as of right now, we will not be able to play our, our home field for this season because of the terrible condition of the outfield. As you know, all of us missed our season last year because of COVID-19. Now that my class is about to graduate, we won't be able to play any games on our home field. I'm asking you and the board, please consider fixing our field so that we may be able to play on it. Uh, or at the very least, the field will be playable for cl classes after us. Thank you, Carter Chambers. Okay. okay. The second public comment uh, came in from uh, Craig Paradiso. Paradiso, thank you. Uh, from 10 River Lane, uh, East Lyme. Good morning, sir. I am an East Lyme resident and have been notified of the DEI strategy plan abomination that is about to be voted for your children to endure. Progressive movement of the systemic racism is proven fallacy that has that has begun to plague U.S. schools. I agree uh, that teaching diversity and inclusion is important to create a harmonious, harmonious uh, generation where physical judgment is no more. Uh, this is the 21st century. However, to smother our children in the strategic plan is unacceptable. It seems the only group touting the enormity of racism. Uh, our groups like the DEI, mandating additional classes, curriculum outside the core classes to drown our children in how whites are evil and blacks and Hispanics are marginalized creates a stronger, stronger divide and adds racism. To, uh, racism. This plan is designed to eliminate, supposedly. Where, where are the Asian uh, American studies, the Amer Indian American studies, Muslim studies, Christian studies, uh, if this inclusion and diversity is, par is paramount, shouldn't such emphasis be on all cultures and backgrounds? I included religion because religion is part of our culture and a large construct of, so of social and so 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 society uh, norms that the DEI neglected to emphasize. Furthermore, the nonsense of canceling groups for exceptional children should not fall into this realm of affirmative action, which this plan is absolutely pushing. The world needs uh, children to strive and excel even when others don't or can't meet uh, at no fall of their own. 
all children should be encouraged for excellence, even if clearly individually uh, unattainable. The DEI strategic plan panders to those who can't and who can't and penalizes uh, those who sh show traits of exceptional of the exceptional. Instead of every of everyone gets a trophy, no one gets a trophy in this plan. Sir, I heavily heart I heavy heartedly beg that this plan does not get past the first or get past in fear of the damage this will cause to the future generations. Instead of defeating racism, this plan will exploit and cause racism to increase exponentially. Create a large forum for all parents to collaborate on how to create a better option should be the option. Sincerely, Craig Perusia Doe. So uh, 10 River Lane, uh, East Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, so that's the other uh, public comment that was um, submitted. Uh, and those are available to see on board box as well. So, okay. So, with that, uh, we'll move on to the approval of some minutes that we have. We have our minutes from our March 22nd, uh, 2021 East Line Board of Education regular meeting. Anybody like to make a motion on those minutes? I will. I would like to move to, move to approve the minutes of the March 22nd, 2021 Board of Education regular meeting. Okay. We want to second it? Second. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, any corrections or modifications to those uh, minutes? Nope. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody oppose? Anybody want to abstain? And those minutes are approved. Uh, uh, let's see, special reports. Uh, is, uh, Kevin Siri sent me an email. And, he is, and he's, he's is he there? I'm here, Tim. Oh, good. Excellent. I can't see because I can't see. He should come up once he starts talking. Okay. Can't see okay. exactly in the, in the space. So, All Kevin, right. would you like to, uh, to uh, uh, give us a report? Sure. Uh, first of all, the bridge work, the uh, shutdown part of the bridge is, still, is completed. There'll still be a little bit of uh, one way uh, during the week and so forth like that, but the uh, work that necessitated being closed for uh, a week and a half and then for four days has been completed. Um, and another item the state has purchased, you may have seen the state has purchased both the Starlight and the mobile station on Route 161. That was on the 15th of uh, last month, they closed on it. Uh, there is a not so much, it's still a couple of years away before the project starts for, as far as the uh, interchange there, but uh, they're trying to fast track the uh, demolition of both those uh, facilities. So I don't know exactly when, but they've said they are trying to fast track it. Uh, moving on, as we all know about the American Relief Plan, uh, town is getting directly about 1.8 million and uh, you know what you're getting about 1.7. And as we've seen too, there's probably more coming through the both uh, the county uh, uh, formula and maybe more from the state, but we're really don't have any definite clarification on that yet. So uh, rather than spe uh, speculate, we're gonna hold off on saying anything there. The Board of uh, Selectmen did have a special meeting last week because we wanna start hearing from some organizations that you know might feel as if they could benefit from uh, some of those funds. We had Karen Chair come in and talk to us. Uh, Pat did a really, their, their chairman did a fantastic job explaining what they do and what their needs are. And it was really nice hearing that uh, even though they haven't had a large increase in numbers, as far as people needing help, the people in need of help, they've needed more. And they explained how you know they don't just hand out cash. If you need heating assistance or something like that, you tell them what you need and they cut the check to the uh, provider. So very nice to hear how they've done. And she's going to come up with a prioritized list of things that they might uh, be able to need. She said it's not so much food, but two very old freezers, things like that, that might be uh, we might be able to help them with. We also heard from the uh, soup kitchen uh, that's based out of uh, St. John's. Uh, there's several they have several facilities in the region. I think six of them. They serve nine towns, East Line being one. And uh, they've seen an increase uh, the, in the region from last year or pre-COVID 900,000 meals to in the past year, one point, I believe 4 million. So a significant increase there. And they she also explained how they go about handing out the food uh, for those events as well. And uh, we're also the Board of Selectmen 
we're meeting uh, this Wednesday, uh, Niantic Main Street comes in uh, and another organization, I can't think of offhand who it is, but we're talking about coming up with a form that organizations, you know, nonprofits and so forth, that they feel that they can benefit from this, you know, a form that will explain their organization, contact the needs and justification and prioritization of what they think. So we're working on that. Uh, there's uh, on a really good positive. Uh, there's a new restaurant opening this Wednesday on Hope Street where the old uh, uh, Burke's Tavern used to be. La Yorna, uh, Mexican restaurant. A lot of excitement, uh, a lot of work has gone into preparation for it. If you'll go inside, you won't even know it was ever Burke's uh, Tavern. Uh, they've done a lot of works. Uh, so, so hoping for some positive uh, uh, outside and inside uh, dining there too. And getting on to outdoor dining um, with the governor extending his, uh, the, uh, the uh, legislature extending the governor's authority. Looks like outdoor dining will uh, mirror last year where they don't have to go through that detailed uh, uh, approval process because uh, you know they're still with COVID lying around. So places like uh, um, you know, down on Main Street, the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Ilianos and places like that won't have to worry about going through that detailed uh, uh, approval process. Not detailed, but a little more involved. Public safety mm -hmm. buildings ahead of schedule. Uh, I had a first walkthrough of it uh, last week. I went through it with the chief. It was really impressive what uh, was seen done so far. Uh, it's on budget and they're looking at late June or early July for that being completed. Uh, September is the uh, completion date, but it, we've been able to, uh, they've been able to do some good work and get ahead of the game there. Celebrating Slime Day has been canceled. I think everybody saw that. Uh, the logistics, talking to Ledge Light and the police, just controlling access to something like that, limiting numbers, having everybody enter one end and go out the other end. It was just too, um, you know, difficult. So they decided not to do that. And the last thing, April 23rd at McCook's, there's going to be a car, a, a trivia contest where everybody remains in their car, up to 45 cars. They've got a limit, so you have to get your uh, tickets ahead of time. But you'll go in and there'll be a large uh, screen where the questions are. You'll be able to get the, uh, the audio in your car. And I'm not sure of any other details, but contact Parks and Rec. It sounds like a great way to have an outdoor community activity considering the constraints of COVID. So that's all I've got. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Any questions for Kevin? Selectman representative? Hey, Kevin, just quick. Do you know, uh, I think the Memorial Day Parade, are they still planning to have that? Did anything change? Nothing has changed with that yet. It's still being planned. Um, and they're still talking about the, that um, artisan art, uh, uh, event on Main Street where you can, you know, they'll have some people set up on Methodist Street and so forth. But no, nothing has been canceled with that yet. Um, that doesn't take quite the lead time that, uh, you know, the getting all the things sold for the, uh, the booths, the vendor booths and so forth for Celebrity Slime. So, um, but uh, I will find out and talk to Pat Hughes, who's the head of the Veterans uh, Organization, see if we can do, get uh, a resolution for that for you. Yeah, just was <laughs> still on. So thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, let's see, do we have uh, any? We do. We have one. Yes, yeah, Sachi's. Okay, just good. Uh, yeah. Hi. Sorry, Grace couldn't make it tonight. Okay. Good. That's good to have you. Hi. So um, everyone back to school is going well. This week will be our first full week back. And some students are a little apprehensive and stressed, but most people are genuinely excited. Um, spring sports just started up last week and practices seem to be going really well. Um, everyone is excited for April break and um, it's a nice uh -oh. week. And AP classes are winding down as there's about one did it break out again? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Just for a couple of seconds. Okay. Um, well, AP classes are winding down um, as there's about one month until most of the AP exams are completed and done. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sashi. Yeah, thank yeah, you, Sashi. Thanks. Any questions for Sashi? Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, say hi to Grace. Well done. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so uh, let's see, that brings us now to our consent agenda. Um, it's been a while since we had something on the consent agenda. Yeah. Consent agenda is, it will be approved. If anyone has any issue or wants to have any clarification on we would remove the item that's on the consent agenda and put it uh, in our discussion the items um, for the evening. But if there's no objection, then I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I would like to recommend approval of the donation to Eastline Middle School from the Seeloff stained glass in the amount of $3,800. Mm -hmm. Okay. And somebody would like to second that? I'll second it, Jill Carini. Thanks, Jill. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody oppose? Anybody want to abstain? Passes unanimously. That's good. Great. Many um, thanks to them again every year. Yeah, every the, year uh, we they, get this the donation donate. yeah. from, uh, yeah. from yeah. these folks, and this was in the amount of uh, three thousand eight hundred dollars estimated. I will sign that happily. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll move into our discussion action items. Uh, for the first one that's up is the proposed appointment for the twelve-month assistant principal at East Lime High School. Uh, Jeff, would you like to? Absolutely. Thank you, um, Tim. So it gives me a uh, great pleasure. I feel like we've had a lot of these discussions lately with Mrs. Kelly at the high school and bringing her on board. Uh, and now uh, Mr. Kidd uh, at the high school moving from the, the recommendation to move him from the 10 month uh, assistant principal to the 12 month uh, assistant principal position at East Lime High School. Henry's done an outstanding job, um, you know, and, and is really uh, been a strong uh, advocate of everything going on at the high school. We've seen that uh, in him as a 10 month and uh, we're looking forward to his work as a, uh, as a 12 month. And he's, he's here tonight if anybody has any brief questions for him, but I know he's excited and uh, thanks for joining us, Henry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, I know I'm excited. yeah, well, that's good. Would you, well, Jamie, would you I like would, to make a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve the proposed appointment of Henry Kidd as the 12 month assistant principal for East Lime High School. Okay, second. And Eric uh, Bauman seconds that um, motion. Any, any further discussion or comment? No? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, passes unanimously. And uh, congratulations, Henry. <laughs> Even though some of the board members wish that you could get back in the classroom, uh, we we'll welcome you to take the challenge of being a 12 month uh, assistant principal. I'm sure that Deb Kelly is extremely happy as well. So, um, Anything so, you wanna share, Henry? Yeah. Sure, I, yeah, sure. Th I, w thank you all very much. Um, when, when you voted to um, approve me in the spring of 2019 as the 10 month assistant principal, I, I did not imagine that um, my first couple of years in administration would be dominated by a, a pandemic. Um, <laughs> but uh, while this period's been challenging, it's been an honor to work alongside uh, the uh, incredible faculty and staff at the high school um, that have, you know, adapted and continue to adapt to all of the changes to the educational landscape uh, with grace and resolve over the past year. Um, they've made uh, our, the administrative team's job much easier because of their commitment to do what's best for our student population. So their support and hard work keep us moving forward each day. Um, my experiences this year, even though the pandemic has continued to dominate things, have only cemented my desire to play an expanded leadership role at the high school. I'm so happy to have all of our students back in the building and I'm really excited to uh, work with our teachers to focus on rebuilding our culture and values as we look forward to next fall. Um, while the pandemic has been hard, I think there's a lot of silver linings, the introduction of one-to-one -one devices for all of our students, changes to our daily schedule, and the renewed focus on social emotional learning and equity and conclusions are all exciting consequences of the past year um, that will continue to transform our learning environment. So I'm really excited to work with um, Ms. Kelly, Principal Kelly, to harness these changes and breathe new life into the school um, community. So I wanna thank the, the board for their continued confidence in me and the opportunity to serve East Lyme students and families uh, in this 12 month position. I'd also like to thank Superintendent Newton and Assistant Superintendent Drown for their support and advice uh, throughout the past couple of years. Uh, and I certainly also would like to thank uh, Ms. Kelly because I have the privilege of working with a great friend uh, and mentor 
whose guidance and support really mean a lot to me. So thank you every, uh, for everything, Deb. I feel like we've been on one long Zoom call together since last March. Um, <laughs> and lastly, I just want to thank my kids, Amelie, Henry, and Ainsley for making me laugh at the end of long days, and my wife, Alexa, for being uh, my best friend, a great mom, and an incredible uh, teacher at East Lime High School. We're a great team. I look forward to many more years of serving East Lime hand in hand with her. So thanks again to all of you for this opportunity. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Henry. Excellent. Okay. All right, we'll move on to our next uh, item, which is the proposed appointment to the 12-month assistant principal at East Lime Middle School. And uh, Jeff, would you like to? Absolutely. So it brings me uh, uh, equally great pleasure um, to bring forward Claudine Kelly uh, at East Lyme Middle School. Um, Claudine has done an exceptional job uh, as well in her 10 month position at the middle school. Um, she really has complemented uh, that building uh, alongside of uh, Mr. Bickard and Mrs. Frost. Um, just brings a special uh, element to, you know, to the middle school of, you know, really working great with staff, working great with kids, the counselors. So um, we just have watched Claudine really grow, you know, in that position. So um, I proudly and, and am honored to bring Claudine uh, Kelly forward as the uh, recommendation for our moving from our 10 month to our 12 month position, uh, assistant principal position. Yeah, excellent. And Claudine is here as well. Uh, this evening. Uh, I believe she's out there. I am. Thank you. There you are. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so with that, would anybody like to make a motion on this one? I will. I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed appointment of Claudine Kelly as the 12 month assistant principal for East Line Middle School. We need a second. Oh, Eric seconds it. Uh, <clears throat> discussion? Okay. Oh. Okay, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody want to abstain? Okay, so that passes unanimously and congratulations, Claudia. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, Claudine, thanks. Uh, Any want to say a few words as well, Claudine? I'm good. Yes, first of all, Henry, congratulations to you. Well deserved. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you even more closely, as well as the high school staff. I would like to thank the Board of Education for your support and your endorsement and your belief in me. I'd like to also thank Superintendent Newton and Assistant Superintendent Drown for navigating us through this most challenging year, as well as um, my colleagues and my administrative team. Anytime I've needed support, everybody's always been there and I feel like I can call and, and lean on any, any, any of them. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Jason Bitgood, um, who also um, I view as not only a mentor, but a friend, um, and Mrs. Frost, the current 12-month principal, who uh, really took me under wing and supported and guided me through um, the last year, as well as you know um, my time as a 10-month at the middle school. Um, I, hats off to our staff. Our teachers have done a tremendous job in navigating this past year and have been so resilient and flexible and adaptable. Um, you know, we've, we've certainly overcome all the bumps and continue to move forward. Really excited with the things that are going to be happening with regards to the blended learning going forward. Um, you know, our work, our building based committee with the, the equity um, and diversity and inclusion, um, our SEL. So many great things that I am so fortunate and honored. I truly am honored to support and uh, work for the community, the students, our families, and for all of you and um, continuing to make advancements and move the middle school um, on to even more exciting and um, bigger things in the future. I can't wait. Good. Excellent. Wonderful. Thanks, Claudine. Good. Okay. Congrats again. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we'll move on to our next item for discussion and action, and that's the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan that we've been uh, working on for the um, past several months. Jeff, do you want to make some comments here? No, I mean, I, 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 and I certainly, if Barry wants to. Yeah, absolutely. I'll kind of turn it over to the ad hoc, you know, committee uh, to share some thoughts. But you know, this has been a lot of work in the making. Um, you know, Barry's put a lot of hard uh, effort into this. Um, this document, um, you know, a lot of back and forth 
uh, 12 versions. I think we uh, we made it up to uh, at least. Yes. Uh, outside of other ones in between. But, you know, I, I think it gives us some good grounding. I think it gives us direction as we look at our new five year plan development, which will happen next fall. Um, I'm excited about it. It will become a main goal. And um, I just I want to thank uh, you know the uh, the committee for their work. So I'll go over to them and Barry, too. And Barry, would you like to make some comments? And I probably didn't cite the document. <laughs> 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 I've been over it so many times. Uh, one thing I do want to say is there's been a lot of input. Uh, people have contacted me uh, about the plan, knowing that I was one of the people on the board and the school system and from the community. And I just want to let everybody know, even though it's a public comment you have tonight, that I've listened very carefully to them. And uh, I tried to just uh, sit, sit through the weight of evidence. And I find that that's why there are so many uh, references on the document. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opinions and ideas out there about how these ideas should be enacted within public schools. And uh, I, you know, just on behalf of the committee, tried to do the best I could of sifting through the weight of evidence on one side and the other of all these issues that come up with that document. The people that have made comments and voices have been heard and uh, they've been included with, uh, with the weight of evidence that the document is And the second thing that I would like to just say about the document and put it in perspective is that most every other document that uh, we reviewed as the committee had a preponderance of emphasis on things that adults did within the district. I think right. this document is unique that the highlight the uh, is the item number three, action item number three, puts the uh, plan directly within the hands of the students, well, within the classroom and within the schools, towards the end of developing their capacity to counter racism and to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so it's, uh, and I think that when people have asked me about what that looks like, uh, there's one example that came up in discussions with the middle school where there was a uh, location where a, a young man from Ecuador came into the classroom, uh, not able to speak a word of English. And uh, what happened was you know, he was floundering in front of the students in the classroom who were learning how to speak Spanish. Uh, they happened in this lesson to be looking at a, a map trying to describe such things. And one of the students get up got up and said to him, it goes, in Espanol, que es la palabra para esto? Pointed to the river. And the big just boy student said, ah, it's a río. And the girl said, we were making a race, and the palabra para este río was called river. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they went back and forth on that, so that the, the students actually, you know, they could have seen him as a sense of uh, exclusion. They could have seen him as widely preferred to have no involvement with them, and they could have uh, avoided engaging him in an equitable educational process. Instead, the students and the teachers work to basically involve that student so that the whole community of that classroom was involved in championing, championing the uh, you know, common racism and advancing that equity, diversity, and inclusion. That's where this plan, if we can implement it correctly, is going to uh, work out. That's the heart and soul of the plan. It's what's going to happen yeah. in the classroom with individual students, you know, working with the issues of uh, racism, sexism, religionism, uh, all the kind of things that exclude people. You know, we want to just basically work all those in the students' classroom. So that's, uh, I'm looking forward to the teachers that I've uh, talked with that are really excited about this, how they think that. Uh, curriculum to uh, bring these uh, topics forward. So it's, it's an instructional plan, as I say it, and it's focused in on what's going to happen in the future. Good. Excellent. Thank you. I'll stop for a second. No, no. I could just talk for a while. That was good. Anybody else have any comments? Uh, Lee, anything you want to add? I mean, just that this document is 
very baby, but I feel very grateful that I was able to go along for the ride here. I mean, I think it's already been said, but this is just so incredibly well researched. There were 12 versions, uh, which I think is a really strong indication that Barry really did listen and try to implement as much feedback as possible. Um, and so very grateful to have you know been able to go along for this ride, but I'm this is incredibly important and I, I feel like it's a really gonna drive us forward in the right direction. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's one that's wonderful. Yeah, it's been a it's been a yeah, it's actually it's been a pleasure to uh to uh, see Barry in, in action. Um and uh the level of uh of detail is just is is extraordinary and, and in fact I think that uh this probably will be uh, uh something Jeff that you you're gonna be uh asked to share with other uh, districts yeah, uh, definitely all yep. surprised. Absolutely yeah so that's good. Um, Barry, would you like to make a motion? You see the motion that we. Sorry, Barry. You want me to read it? You, why don't you take it over? Okay. okay. You can We'd love to. <laughs> Go ahead, Jamie. The board hereby moves to approve the recommended DEI strategic plan. The board further moves to authorize Shipman and Goodwin LLP to engage the Equity Institute on its behalf to conduct an audit of the district's DEI practices and initiatives. And would you like to second that, Barry? Hey, excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me. Point, no. Uh, point of order. Um, would you, uh, whoever that is, uh, you please mute. There's no, there is no option for uh, public comment or engagement at this point. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Anybody else have any comments? Jill, anything I, from your side? No, I think it's extremely well written. I'd like to, if I'm allowed to say thank you to Barry and tell him how grateful I am. Well, really to all the group, but thank you. Okay, uh, Jamie? Can I, I, I would just like to comment on the fact that Barry did a great job on this. I know this has been, put it around for you to the DEI Institute to work on for quite some time. I know it's been before the board a couple times for our review and our um, meetings at public hearings. And I just want to say that I'm thankful and grateful for all the hard work that you put into this. Thank you for doing it. I think that uh, all of us are working together to try to make this district the best district in the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? So with that, uh, we have a motion. So all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, any opposed? Any that want to abstain? Abstain passes unanimously and excellent. And uh, away we go. So uh, in right. good shape on that. Okay, the next item up for discussion is the East Line Public School five day instructional plan. Uh, Jeff? Uh, yes, yeah, so hopefully everybody had a chance to take a look at the um, uh, blended learning um, slides that were uh, present uh, in uh, board docs. Amy's just going to, this is, you know, we've, we've shared out this is our blended learning model as you look at, you know, five days, which started this week, which I think you know, a lot of kids are excited and a couple of them were a little apprehensive. And, you know, my daughter was kind of <laughs> on the fence. So that's for sure. Yeah. So, but um, Amy, I'll turn it over to you to kind of summarize those, uh, those slides. Sure. So we wanted to make sure we provided consistency to parents. So one of the things that we committed to at the beginning of the year when we were reopening, red, yellow, and green represented the different pathway we were on, depending on where the health department was. So we sort of started with this layout on our, on our instructional pathways. Um, and when we decided to go hybrid, we communicated out to parents using this exact template of sort of letting them know what's my student's experience going to be like, how are they going to be graded, and what's attendance going to be, so that it was something that parents could wrap their head around when they're in that pathway. So we thought it was important that what we realized is, wait a minute, we're back on site five days. They need the green instructional pathway documents because technically we're now in the green in our reopening plan for the fall. So one of the commitments that we made to parents was that our principals, because the students are back five days a week, and this is something Jeff and I have talked a lot about it, you know, as a, at the district level, we've had to communicate out to parents 
on behalf of the expectations, but now that that was when kids weren't in the building five days a week. Now they are, so the expectation was that these slides were sent to parents as a means of just communicating that while your child's in, how do we define blended learning and what does that look like? And so what I did is I worked with the Instructional Pathways Committee and they helped me to develop these slides. So a, a group of my committee of teachers and really try to develop some language. Um, just know that there's a teacher version of these slides that actually has you know live documents and common language resources that go to teachers that obviously didn't go to parents because they're looking at it from a different lens. But again, just trying to provide parents clarity with what does it even look like? Because they haven't lived five days on site with the technology and our child can and neither of our teachers. So just wanting to be clear about what the student experience is, how we're documenting and, and defining blended learning, but then also just being clear in regards to how we're defining what learning experiences look like in the classroom. And one of the, to be honest, the number one question we get for parents is, does my kids still need to bring their device to school every day? Right. Yes, they <laughs> because do. Because for a while, it was thought of as an emergency action because I don't know when my child might be learning from home and it was seen as a reactive. So also just trying to get our principals to just communicate to the family, no, nope, this is our way of being, this investment, and this is what it looks like, but realizing our kids haven't been five days with us since last March. Uh, and really having to reset that. So what, again, just one of these to kind of provide clarity for you as to what we're putting in parents' hands. We by no means expect our teachers to master blended learning by June. I mean, blended learning is to take and look at your instructional block that you have with kids and really think about it and sort of this 50-50 model that you want this cross-integrated, tech-integrated experience. Take some time, but this is where just so you know how we're supporting teachers, because I think this is important. You can't send out expectations for students and teachers without supporting them. So one of the things my Instructional Pathways Committee actually needs to speak, uh, we are developing what's called an EdCamp model where we actually are having teachers teach teachers and highlight sort of effective practices within the blended learning model um, within the next couple of weeks. Great. So again, just trying to be clear with, we haven't been in the green. This is our right. first time in the green and the reopening and, and just trying to be clear with parents around what that means to provide consistency. A lot of the boxes are, we try to stay as consistent as possible so parents would know your child's still getting traditional grades, they're still taking attendance every day. Yes, you still need to log in to see, so on your child's still gonna be in Google Classroom, you know, and try to be consistent on those things. So again, just trying to put in your hands what we're sending out to parents for them to know. Um, and support them as they sort of transition back. Um, and like I said, we are on day one of the five-day on-site mm -hmm. on model. I'm, so, I'm, in, I'm stopping into classrooms tomorrow to sort of see what you know it looks like, but I mean, we're, we're day one in it, should I say, in a model we haven't been in. Um, in a model. Yeah. It's crazy to think about. Yeah. I think for us, the biggest thing we want to message to is that we're not going back, we're only going forward. So by the Board of Ed investing in the tools, we have a due diligence and a responsibility to move those tools forward. And so how do we do that with intention and making sure the teachers are supported in those efforts? So um, that's sort of just a quick overview of, of sort of what was handed to them. Um, and then our, obviously our principals are on and they've been communicating. And some of them are already having meetings with their teachers in regards to just what they need to do in order to execute. But we're on day one, so I don't have sort of much data to tell you yeah, how it's going, but I mean, it, it's out there. Question so. for Amy, yeah. Jeff on this, Lee, and then Jamie. So both. Oh, my just a quick comment. I just wanted to say how I found these three slides and the graphics just to be so easy to understand yeah. and navigate. They're so incredibly clear. Um, I just really appreciate this, yeah. this format. I thought it was great. I do have to say, Jeff has a parent advisory council, and the parents, one of the things we loved about the long range plan work is that the parents were the best at wordsmithing. So that the language spoke to oh. somebody who just picked it up. So Good. I will say that we tapped into two of the parents from the parent advisory yeah. and said, give a friendly read to see from a parent lens without knowing anything. Great. Can you wrap your head around sort of what the learning experience is going to look like for your, for your child? Smart. So that, yeah, that really shines through here. Yes. Good. 
So I'm going to have the unpopular opinion in the room. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Sorry. I <laughs> so here's my problem. Yeah. We've had kids face to face with a computer since March 13th. And now we're sending them back to school five days a week and putting them in front of a device again. I hate it. I, I just. I get like we used to do it as part of like an enrichment. And I'm I love that. I don't love that we're putting them back in front of a device again. And if that's so we've always said that we're not going to tell teachers how to teach, mm -hmm. that it's their gift, mm -hmm. that I am not a teacher. So by no means am I going to tell a teacher how to teach. That's the gift that they have. I do not have that gift. But if a teacher can teach what they're teaching without giving them an iPad, I believe we should let them. I do not believe that I should tell a teacher that you're going to teach it, but you're going to teach it with this. Because I want the kids to be taught by a teacher in school, unless it's something that's being enriched with the device. Especially since for a year they've been like this. I, I just. Yeah, that's understandable, Jane, with the screen time. I yeah. just think that if they can do it face to face, be it six feet apart, mm -hmm. I think that's how it should be taught. Yeah. So one of the and, and one of the links of the thread to parents to grow learning a little bit more is that one of the we sort of committed to as we look at the blended learning, we committed to encouraging our teachers to apply part of what's called the flipped classroom model, the individual rotation model, or the station rotation model, which basically is just honing in on small group instruction, if you think about it for lack of a better way. So one of the pieces that we're trying to hone in is this integration of technology, not replacement of teacher technology. So we are, I mean, one of our claims to fame here in Eastline is the fact that we were late to the tech game <laughs> because we did a lot of relationship building and quality sort of one-on-one. -on -one. But I think one of the things that we're noticing though is there is a level of efficiency that comes with some of the tech integration that is freeing up more instructional time for students to be able to actually learn together and do the work. So some up through some of those efficiencies, like I'll, I'll tell you, there was a math do now lesson using this Desmo software. Oh, that that <laughs> software that is on there, right? I mean, those students walk in, I was just in a Zoom today. The students walk into the Zoom, they are on that for four minutes. Every pro every problem is done and like it's completely categorized by who got what right. And immediately that teacher moves into breakout rooms. So within I timed it within six minutes. The do now was down, there was breakout rooms, and the teacher and the para. We're going around giving one more additional problem set just to get them in the room. And I debriefed with the teacher afterwards and I said, normally this would be more of like a 15 minute experience. So to them, I just gained that much more time to actually do the instruction with the students, mm -hmm. but I'm not taking away my relationship with those students. So, but that's what that's high school, thing. middle school? This is middle school. This is middle school. So yeah, then what about elementary grade. school? So at elementary, we use it much more in like a station or a rotation basis. So it has its place in a given time. You know, if I'm looking at Dreambox, let's think of the software that you <laughs> are engaged in, this would be a station that is strictly the outcome is sort of fact fluency development. That's it. And they are there for only a piece of time. It is only integrated in to give them information on what the child, and then they can keep rotating through. So it's not meant to replace a person. It's meant to either enhance the instructional environment, but also uh, it's got to, we've got to start giving some independence to students as to when they try to activate the technology with it, right? So promoting choice. So, you know, seeing a menu board in second grade and seeing that students have four stations that they have to work through, but I need to self-manage or executive function myself to decide which station to go to first. Because that's a good life skill. I have to decide, do I want to do the math station today? Am I going to do the little three station tomorrow? How is I going to work and sort of develop that capacity? But I certainly understand 
Uh, you are not the first parent. And we're very aware of that perspective. Yeah. So know that, that is not, that is just because, Yeah, especially when you go down in the grade levels too. Well, because you know? I have a first, ninth, and twelfth. Yep. So my first grader spends all day on Seesaw. So it's uh, Dreambox, Lexia, mm -hmm. and then a couple other ones I'm not real familiar with. But it's all these Seesaw activities that it's just all day long. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, the high school, it's Membeam and something else that I'm not going to remember. But I just don't want to see the kids being teachers being replaced by devices. Yeah, that won't happen. Okay. Yeah. We're, that's we're that's we're my big thing. Here. We're big on because it is a gift. Teaching here. is a gift. If, yeah. if all you did to right. teach was to give somebody a bunch of links, then why do we need the wonderful stuff that we have? Mm -hmm. it, teaching is a gift. And I believe that we should support our teachers in their gifts because I don't have that gift. Yeah. And I love that we do have so many gifted professionals in our districts. Okay. okay. No, that's a good yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, change, yeah big changes are, are tough. I, I, yeah. Now, big speaking one. from where Barry and I come from, I remember when uh, I was in college and we had to make a transition from using slide rules to calculators. <laughs> and there were people that thought that we were not we were going we were going to be brain dead because we didn't know how to work, work with, a, with a slide rule. You know, and uh, that was uh, we, we I think we made that transition, but I, I think Jamie's points right on. That's what I was gonna make the one comment is, is I would love to hear a little more more updates on how things are. are you know, proceeding with this, um, because this is day one. It'd be ni nice to hear what like, you know, week yeah. two is like, or, or right. week four and, and right. things like that. Cause I'm sure you're going to have, there would be some, there are going to be some bumps in the road. I'm sure. Yeah, so. for sure. We can, we can have at any point teachers report out. We have representatives for the board. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Obviously yeah. Ask them to come to the full board and mm -hmm. we can have sort of a, a feedback session. Yeah. Week. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Jeff, anything else to add? Oh, Barry, I'm sorry. Oh, we're going to slide you one more time. <laughs> <laughs> still have yours, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I still couldn't work it, too. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to do this quickly, and I, I don't mean this at all uh, to be uh, critical. I'm always in the idea of like, how are we going to do what this thing to become the very best district in the state? You know, my idea of uh, eventually you get to a budget plan that says, here's what we are doing in the district. You know, here's the outcomes, you give us $50 million to get this happening. And so I keep looking for like, where are the points to start? How can we get, how can we get from where we are now to that point? And there's some small things here that are, your suggestions are possible things we could build on with some refinement to start making a small step for that. Just by illustration, you know, like whatever the first slide on the right hand side, those three bullets are all independent. And you can look at them, school group is definitely different from St. Mary's, it's definitely different from St. Mary's. So we love it. Second slide, live instruction, synchronous learning, independent collaboration, district, they were all independent of the three and legally understood understandable. I go to the third slide. I see the possibility for a greater integration of curriculum assessment and grading. And if we could get a greater integration of those three boxes with more precision on what we're trying to do, we could start making a small step, you know, towards that division that I have for how we could um, work the full process together. And I could start with uh, any one of those, but let me start down with grading. That it says, you know, grade, communicate master skills. Completely understandable. Given this note and multiplication, they don't want to come note and multiplication. The term group then picked out of me. So, okay, that's an interesting term. And I've heard it talked about in many ways. You know, is this growth in terms of, uh, the performance index, this growth in terms of uh, the competencies in uh, social emotional learning is 
is the growth in terms of their ability to champion diversity. Uh, you know, is this um, um, so? Where is the growth issue? And then how? Then so that comes up with assessment. You know, Susan will be assessed using paper and online tools. Well, can we be more precise? I can understand assessment in terms of math, spelling, and reading. But is there a way, if we did have a good outcome of, um, let's say, there are many, many things out there that uh, you see in the documents, but the one that comes up all the time is the competencies of social emotional learning. That is just one. There are many others that are possible. But if that was the one, somehow that would be melded within the uh, assessment process. Now, I noted before that, for example, that in discussions with uh, teachers and principals that ask the question, you have, if you, you know, talk about, well, we're committed to social emotional learning, and then I'll ask about, do you have coordinates and some of the assessments on the social emotional learning competency? And as yet, I've not gotten an answer on that because we're doing it. So if, if we have a growth outcome, then that will be melded in with the assessment process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then that will be melded in within the curriculum. Uh, and I look at those four bullets, and it's hard to understand if those are four overlapping or four discrete, uh, discreetly different processes. You know, I looked up some of the terms of accelerated learning. There's a, a wide breadth of definitions of what accelerated learning is. And as I read some of the definitions, they all seem to be focused on individual, some relationship overlap with individual learning results. And there's some overlap with the uh, responses and learner focused teaching, and some overlap with priority based uh, or standards based curriculum. So if so, there's kind of there's not a discreteness to that curriculum. So, you know, there are four, there are four valid issues, but you know, they're kind of like, well, it could be one, one or the other or all four. If somehow we could get this so that the graded assessment curriculum and say, here's what we're trying to develop as teachers. Here's what we're trying to develop. Here's how we're grading it. And here's how the curriculum is set up to develop things like students' ability to be responsible decision makers. You see what I mean? I so it's it's yep. that's part of the I'm not I'm not critiquing this. No, it's great. You know, I'm just I'm trying to <laughs> say that I think this is a good stepping stone. Mm -hmm. A first step that we could move off of if we could get a greater, more precise integration between kind of what is our overarching objectives or our grand theme. We could even talk about this in terms of uh, eventually get to a graduate post, right? Something like that. Because I've heard, you know, there's a lot of those different ideas on the table. If we can right. start picking on one or two and start to build this into this plan, we could start to get more precision on it and more clear explanation of what we're doing in our curriculum that we are going to assess using a certain grading process to achieve this end or outcome that we're trying to get in the system. Mm -hmm. No, that's kind of like how I read this. And I'm, I hope that it's taking this as a suggestion or just an idea to bandy around with your uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's in alignment with a lot of the district improvement conversations that Jeff, Tim, and I are having because we sort of, that's what we're in. We're trying to synthesize together is you have sort of the CASA work, then you, you know, you look at sort of the ESP, you don't know, we don't know where the DEI audit is going to land, you know, instructionally, and then sort of what, how do we commit, what are we committing to within that work and sort of synthesize that work and then allow that through that is how we sort of accomplish some of these. And then that's where some of the curriculum instruction and assessment alignment could come from once the, those commitments are made. And, we, you know, we've been having for a while, the magic number was three because we had too many goals. I mean, yeah. we're down to three. Now we're like, maybe it's just one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the avenue is clear and there's clarity. And then we can start the alignment to them. So absolutely. Um, I think that's a lot of the work we're doing. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, very good. good. Very good. Yeah. 
Very good. Anybody else? Okay. Oops. I'll keep you posted. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, de I, yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that's a lot good. Um, okay, so we'll move on then uh, uh, to our next uh, grouping here, and it's uh, for discussion. And this is the ESSER grant funds. And uh, the 2021-22 uh, uh, Board of Education adopted budget. And Jeff, do you want to? Yeah, what I did was uh, we've worked with FFO and talked through um, these two pots of money, uh, the ESSER II grant funding, uh, which is at you know 772,000, and then that other pot of money, which is a separate pot, which we don't have you know final confirmation on. Um, that's you know that ARP um, funding. We're kind of <laughs> calling it ESSER three uh, in a way to keep them clean and, and distinguished. But you know, right now we're heavily in the process of you know uploading all the information in for ESSER two because that's due by April nineteenth. So what I wanted to do is just you saw. Hopefully you had a chance to take a look at the slides. I'm going to share just a couple of slides, and then we wanted to take these slides and incorporate them into the Board of Finance slides for the presentation on Thursday to kind of share out some of our thoughts and our ideas. But obviously we need to have that conversation here first. So let me just share my, uh, my screen to talk through uh, a couple of these. Um, there we go. All right, there's my calling right there. So <laughs> jump right in, whatever that was. Um, so let's just start with the uh, ESSER, uh, ESSER two. Just, just for clarity's sake, you know, four main priorities um, with this. And uh, Grant, I don't know if there was a way on your computer, can you minimize your, yeah, just so. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Um, so four main priorities that, uh, you know, we have to focus on, you know, through through the ESSER II funding. And I'll kind of show you an outline of what we're, we're thinking about for, for those dollars. The first one, you know, being you know, real learning loss, academic supports uh, across the uh, across the district. Um, there's an element of, of acceleration and, uh, and recovery uh, in there as well. Second, family and community connections um, that uh, you know we may be reaching out uh, through social work services, et cetera. You know, school safety that's aligned with some of our building needs could be HVAC, um, some of those things we talked about. You know, those at FFO, um, and then uh, remote learning staff development that digital divide, uh, and we have a component that ties in with that fourth uh, bullet there as well. So those are the four priorities that we have to speak to. You know, through the grant. And uh, it, it's a pretty involved process. Smart goals are involved with it. The development of those uh, strategic, measurable, attainable, results-oriented, and timely, you know, goals. It stands for, you know, for smart. Um, so when you break down, and we're guaranteed uh, the 772. That's what you know uh, our district is receiving, and every district is receiving a different uh, amount. But when we kind of outline what the use of these dollars, we broke it down, you know, in this facet. Let's start on the right there, um, the two-year summer instructional pathway. We've already talked about that, um, roughly 150000 for each summer, this summer coming up, and then the following summer, there'd be another program that we'd be looking to implement. So it would be a two-summer program. Um, then professional development would tie into this, uh, where Kim Davis, and Kim's on the line if we want to talk to Kim, but um, Wilson training, so reading, um, some reading training for teachers, about 30 teachers that need that level one Wilson training. And there's 10, roughly 10 that need the level two that already have level one. So it's, it's not cheap, but it's, a, it's uh, an important component of some of our, uh, our reading support you know, for kids. So we have some professional development in there. Jeff, could you tell me again what Wilson training is? Kim, you want to give a just a rough? Apologize. No, that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. Wilson, uh, Tim, is a prescriptive reading program that's multi-sensory, multi-sensory, excuse me, and systematic. And so it really sort of cracks the code, if you will, of reading uh, for students. And it was developed for students who are struggling readers or students with dyslexia. Um, and it's, it's really become um, sort of a gold standard of reading instruction for students with learning disabilities and other, other disabilities um, to close the gaps and um, improve on students' ability to decode words, so break them apart, sound them out, and encode words to spell them and put them back together. So um, it's, a, um, it's prescriptive in that the teachers have to go through training, which includes um, a practicum experience where they are um, 
uh, observed by uh, a trained professional and then, you know, given feedback and coached. And then they do that over the course of a year before they're actually certified to participate. So it's more than your typical, you know, attend a program one day, here are the resources, you're on your own. It's a very, it's a year long course, if you will, that teachers participate in and ultimately um, earn a certification. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Kim. Um, so if we go to the bottom and work our way uh, up from uh, on the left side, bottom to top. So elementary psychologists, currently our three elementary psychologists are, uh, three of them are 0.8. Um, at each of those uh, buildings. We wanna increase that 0.2 to make them 1.0 to bring forth a little bit of extra support. And then we are looking through the ARP, we'll talk about it at another time, but some potential additional psychology support at the elementary level. Um, the middle school, uh, a middle school social worker, we've identified some cohorts of student students that really you know, are requiring some uh, assistance. I don't kind of start naming cohorts just for you know, some confidentiality components, but there are some students um, that we've really seen that have struggled uh, emotionally and uh, we're looking to support those. You know, we have one social worker at the middle school level you know, with you know, 800 students in that, you know, in that building. Benefits associated um, with that individual um, and then uh, home internet access. This is that, that last fourth priority. This would be providing families like we've done through this year, providing them with uh, internet access at home for free, uh, where we would be covering the cost of that. We had over 30 families that took advantage of that this year. So we want to 39, we're up to 39, yeah. So to continue to provide you know, a level of support for families to have free internet you know, at, uh, at home. And then, uh, yeah, at the high school and the middle school, um, something that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's been done, hasn't been done in my time here in the last, you know, seven years, but um, duct cleaning, um, HVAC components at the high school and middle school. So roughly, Chris is still, Chris Lund's still working on quotes of this, but we're identifying about $120,000 roughly for all that duct work uh, cleaning. Not that there's issues with, you know, our, our system. I think we're in very, very good shape. It's just, it's something that, you know, should be, uh, should be done. And we have an opportunity to do it, which ties right in with this, with this grant. Um, so that's uh, kind of what we're proposing, you know, for ESSER allocation of funds. Um, so that's strictly through uh, the total allotment of 772,913. Um, we can come back to that, but let's just talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan or what I kind of called ESSER 3, uh, totally separate pot of money, um, roughly 1.9 million uh, is what, you know, we're supposed to be uh, receiving. We don't have, again, we don't have confirmation on that. Um, we're still waiting on that, so we don't want to obviously make any decisions, but there's also an element of time here, which, you know, if we're going to put some support staff in place using these funds, we want to get out of the gate pretty quick because uh, every other district around us is doing the same exact thing. So you're going to, we're going to run out of good people that we're trying to, to bring on board. So I, I won't read that verbatim. You can kind of take a look at it. Maybe you already did, but you know, 20% of the grant you know, is reserved for that you know, addressing learning loss um, components. So we've, we've already talked about that. And then you can see you know, the remaining 80% on you know, bringing in some staffing uh, components and support. Um, there's academic SEL um, and uh, you know, air quality is on there as well. So as the last sentence there today, again, we've not received any information yet from the state as to how we go apply for those grants. We, from what we've gathered and what we heard on a couple of webinars, Mariana and I, it's going to be a very similar process uh, to what ESSER 2 has been. Probably not as involved, though, uh, with the level of development of SMART goals and uh, um, going about a systematic approach. So let's break down, again, estimated if we get, you know, 1.9 million, which they're saying that we're supposed to get. Um, we've started to break down the allocation of this funding. So I just want to talk about two areas specifically. First and foremost at the top, the operating budget deficit. So this current year, we all know we've got a $500,000, a little over $500,000 deficit because of COVID, all of the COVID expenses, plexiglass, PPE, et cetera. Um, we've talked about going to the town for a special appropriation for that money. Uh, to me, challenging to do that. And we talked at FFO about going and asking for money from the town when we have this money potentially you know, um, uh, available to us. I don't think that's necessarily appropriate to go ask for you know five hundred thousand dollars when we can use use this pot. That's what it's part of what it's for. So um, we would offset that cost for this year and leveling out our operating budget uh, this year. And then on the left there, the uh, uh, next year's twenty one twenty two 
operating budget offset. We've already, you've already approved the budget for, you know, and adopted the budget for next year. But on the next slide, I'll show you kind of how we might potentially break down cutting into that um, increase, uh, which is sitting at a 3.95% increase right now. I'm sorry, 3.79% increase right now. Um, and if we break down that 431,000, and bef just before I go to the next slide to show that breakdown, this would be the, on the right is the remaining allocation. If you take out obviously the 500 and the, you know, the 431. So then on the next slide, just a breakdown of, of what we could do to help offset that increase going into next year. Um, we've got the two kindergarten teachers in the budget, additional kindergarten teachers in the budget for next year, the two additional second grade teachers in the budget for next year. Um, employee benefits that tie into that, and then the six paraprofessionals. So if we utilized uh, 431,916 of that 1.9 million, um, we could take a chunk out of next year's adopted Board of Ed budget, bringing it down from a 3.79 to a 2.95% increase. So it'd be you know under three. Um, you are, on our side, the district is allowed to use this money to offset the operating budget. Obviously, we need to be very careful with that because you don't want to leave a big hole in future budget years by you know, hiring staff and then not having the money as it runs out to cover them down the road. So that's a concern, obviously. But um, we think you know, through the next you know, two years, three years, as we have this funding available to us, we potentially you know, could maybe absorb some of these positions into the operating budget or through attrition. I don't know, maybe some of them, if there's not a need, we don't, we don't have the positions. Um, so... That's kind of what we were looking at, you know, roughly for that breakdown. Again, we don't have this money yet. So this is just a, an early synopsis and we're already working on that other 900,000, some other ideas. And we want to bring those forward probably on April 26th to that board meeting and talk through those, but we'll use FFO. We're going to schedule another FFO meeting before that meeting to kind of work through that process. Uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of talk about it. Um, and then lastly, um, so you can kind of see what I just told you for numbers. 3.79 would drop if you if we reduced the operating budget by 431,000. You know, moving that onto the board of finance to to 2.95 you percent know, of an increase. So I'll that's I'll pause there. Um, I kind of had a chance to look at uh, you know the the slides and again I'll want to use these in the board of finance presentation, but you know not not up front. We'll put them at the at the end, kind of as a you know. And here by the way, here's some additional information that the board of ed is is processing through. And no decisions need to be made, you know, right now. And because we don't, again, we don't even have confirmation on the 1.9. That's what we've been told we're getting, but we don't have that, you know, locked in. So um, I'll kind of open it up to, you know, thoughts, questions, uh, you know, ideas. It's, it's early, but what do we, uh... yeah, Jamie, go ahead. So I'm all in on the social workers and the psychologists. I'm sure everyone's. As we talk about that and stuff coming. Yeah. Um, my only concern is how we're going to pay for it in the future. Yeah, it's, it's the question does it stay or does it not right. stay? Because you know, I do we address to, the issue? I would hate to start to fix our children and our staff's mental health only to then turn around the next year and take it away. Um, agreed. Yeah, agreed. So I'm all in on it. I just, I'd like a plan for how we're going to pay for it in the future. Um, some kind of conversation around that. Yeah, and that's the yeah. That's the question. Does it does it remain? Right. Um, and then if it does, how, right. how do how you how do you pay for it in the future? Um, yeah, you have to be very cautious with I'm that. Hopeful that the internet access falls off, right? Yes. Yeah, it definitely the should. Pathways will fall off. Yep. The professional development will fall off. Exactly. The duct cleaning will fall Done. off. Yep. And then we're we have the social worker psychologist left. Mm -hmm. So. How will we fund that in the future? Mm -hmm. that, that's my big question. Yeah. Because I'm all in on social workers and psychologists. I just, we need a plan of action for how we're going to pay for them when ESSER and ESSER 1, 2, 3 fall goes away. <laughs> yes. Yeah, good points. Eric, any other thoughts? FFO or, no, I mean, we, we talked about this a lot at FFO, and I think we wanted to make sure it's a pretty complicated story. So we did want to make sure we you guys had a chance to look at it, think about it some more after hearing it. And I'm sure you'll have more questions because I, I think every time we hear it, it kind of raises more thoughts or questions. And the difference between the two 
um, is important because one, I guess, in the bank, one we're going to get, and one we think we're going to get. Yeah. And then, well, we're going to get probably get something. We just don't know how much, and that could vary a lot. So um, we also talked about, you know, as we go to the board of finance, that the importance of telling, you know, what are, you know, our strategy piece. First, like what do we want to invest in? Why do we want to invest in? What are we doing? And then the second part later is about well, how is it funded? Because the funding story is much more complicated than normal sources. There's multiple sources. Which is why I asked my question yeah. because the board of finance will ask that question, and yeah. we should have some kind of a. I mean, I personally would like to know how we're going to fund it in two years, but I mean, the board of finance. Is, is going to ask the exact same question and we should have some kind of feasible answer for them yeah we don't want to put ourselves in a hole that, yeah. that's for sure we don't want to yeah. make a big budget hole yeah. for, in, so we in, thought now two years from now yeah so we thought that um and this was actually kate's uh, suggestion um that as we got kind of on thir Thursday, right? Last year, I think. Last Thursday, when we go through this this conversation, oh, this, yeah. this this these slides are kind of well, the SR two money is kind of like well, that's that's kind of more real, okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh, relief fund money is still kind of up up in the air. That that the FFO would be meeting again to continue to figure out exactly what's the right the best thing to do, and and we would we certainly would invite uh, uh, some. Board of Finance members to kind of join in the work uh, of trying to, you know, kind of uh, figure out what's the best thing to do and how to do it. Um, so it's kind of a workshop type of, a, of, a, of an idea and maybe have that occur at the FFO level. Um, so, so this is just work in progress. Um, and uh, what will be, what's, it hasn't, we haven't done anything to change what we're requesting um, from the board for, for the operating budget. For the 21 2022 um, uh, budget, but um, what we have this situation that we, we need to really have a good conversation on. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So, good. John, oh, John, I'm sorry. I missed the last FFO because legislature's in session. Um, <laughs> I don't know, you just can't work on this. The, the, what's the funding? Like it's fine to plan and all that stuff, but like we're still reevaluating what these guests look like in the year, right? So it's like I, I look at this as like a block grant and just do it, invest, and as you're saying, like two years, who knows? We're gonna have to probably you know partner with the public private partnership side, Daigle Foundation, whatever it may be, right? To figure out how the school psychologists work. But mm -hmm. if, like this is if there's a time to do it, just just do it. I mean, it the ECS funding mechanism is all changing. Sure. So, or, or both the same last year, whatever, right? It's all so. Yeah. I, I, I get the board of finances regard and planning out, but I mean, I've been, you know, we've been doing this a long time. In terms of, it all changes sporadically over a six month process. So. Yeah, and I'm just looking at it as a one year support yeah. and getting those supports in place. Because that, you know, that middle school social worker, for instance, you know, we have a need. Yeah. We've identified cohorts, get it fixed, and then you'd have to reassess after that. You know. Uh, should could it stay? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But address the issue now. Very good. Very good. Just uh, two things on that line that the district has not received information from states. Um, Which slide, Jan Bear? I'm sorry. Uh, you're saying that you, know, you haven't. Oh, received, yeah, four. Yep. Haven't received information yet from the state about the award or application process. Um, without the voting sources. I'm like close to one of the groups that had an inner working in the governor's office. The operative word that's coming out of those small groups is bold. That the if the application process that comes in from, you know, I mean, there's the school districts, there's the rests, there's the uh, daycare centers, mm -hmm. uh, there's the parks and recreations people, uh, and then there are the uh, private enterprises, the summer camps. All these people are out there waiting to apply for this money. The operative word obviously that is being bandied about is bold. 
that if the application process is not for programs, if programs are not bold, innovative, forward moving, those to move our education system forward, no, they are not going to be um, come to the top of the pile for the application process. So I just want to get that idea out there to say that uh, as you are thinking about this, like you know that the plans you have here are you know kind of thing uh, the traditional block grant kind of stuff money's going to come and as long as we say we're going to do it it's good it's good to have it. i would also have ready oh i see yeah. full plan you know so if the, the word comes out that we're not going to take traditional things that the money's going to go to the districts that really have some bold ideas that might be a contingency that you have, you know, to be ready for. Because again, the board and that's what's going to be coming down. And we're not ready for it. We will we'll be beat out by the rest by the summer camp, um, by the daycare center. Um, and the second point that I have is um, that on the point of bringing up the small steps of how we're going to move forward the budget. If we could get somehow in the practice of all these budgets just connecting into what we're going to do with it. You know, I'm looking at, for example, the, the first slide, and I'll just pick out one on the bottom, the professional development per se. Right. We should be able to say in the district currently, the situation is with so many leaders at level one, level two, level three. As a result of this professional development, our goal is to advance from the, the migration of improvement, you know, and so we should be able to say that, you know, our goal is not just to get $200,000 to expect such a goal. Our goal is to migrate students X percent right. at these yeah. levels by the end of the two yeah. years. Yeah. And then to, to achieve that migration, you know, we're going to Listen. do professional development. Yeah, that's budget, yeah, I we'll have to write do that. the same thing. The psychologist is a currently yeah. case for the current thing. We're going to include, we're going to, in social work, we have a current case for the first thing. We're going to yeah. do that. So every one of these, you know, we could bring it into some type of, instead of just a money figure, there's actually a process, yeah. something yeah. we're trying to achieve with each one of these for which the money comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. If we could do something like that. I think we could start moving forward on the small steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. That's a, not a good. Story. No. No. Absolutely. Thank you. No, and if if ARP is the same process as ESSER two, um, we're going to do have to be doing a lot of that because it is identifying specific and strategic and measurable goals as to how we're going to be obtaining you know some of those those pieces. So uh, definitely. John, did you want to very spot on? Right. Of the bank yeah. application to a lot of the folks in the governor's office in, in multiple states. There's so much money. There's so yeah, that's <laughs> that's what I've heard from the yeah, on the rest yeah, of the side. Yeah, top of they don't, they don't, there's so much there that they don't know so to do much money it. today, but it, it's it's being strategic and being bold like like you're discussing. They are finding new ways to give out that money in different ways. So just yeah. be very on point with all that. It's and, and we could take advantage of that right now in terms of bringing it to the next level like Barry mm. it's, it's there. Mm. And we've we've listed out already. We've done a lot of, of work. We kind of shared it a little bit at FFO of you know for the ARP the remaining ARP funds. One, for yeah. instance, is you know having a pathways coordinator of sorts or something along the, the pathways component. We've talked about that as being an important element um, at the high school, at coastal. You know, trying to generate more support. You know, for uh, for something of that nature. So kind of some areas that we really need to be focused on the continued blended learning. Um, I know you know kind of. My, <laughs> working towards the use of technology uh, through instruction in an appropriate manner, but those are the areas we have to be attacking. It's like Massachusetts has a huge billion dollars. It's, yeah, it's like it's crazy money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's probably going to be more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with the and stuff here, I mean, it's it's amazing in terms of, I mean, tax revenue and stuff like that, but at the same time, they have state Yeah, yeah. 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 Go yeah, good point. Good. Yep. Yeah, no, no, very good. Very good. Yeah, we should probably have something 
report back uh, the next board meeting. Um, you we need uh, to, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So we talk at FFO and then bring something in more detail back. Hopefully by then too, we should, I would hope we'll know about, you know, the, uh, uh, what I'll, again, I'll call SR3 or the ARP funding, that 1.9 million, if, if it's locked yeah. in. Again, we've heard nothing, you know, Mariana or I have heard anything as of yet, but yeah. still sure. want to get our, you know, it's it's got to be there. It's just when when are we going to hear? Yeah. So, and okay. hopefully it is the one point nine. Okay. Good. So. Still question. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I just had this idea that if you could probably or possibly allow teachers to submit ideas for what they might consider to be bold programs that could impact learners, and I know we just talked about getting our learners motivated, and our, our teachers are some of them motivated from burnout feeling you know like it's so exhausted so getting them engaged again and excited about whatever their pet project might be and having them submit just like a one-page document like and, and have smart goal objectives that would be built into it and having them throw these ideas out there and, and you know as far as the stem might get involved like i know there's some talk about getting talk allocated now and getting People are excited about more things in the environment. I mean, the, the idea that these are endless, I think the projects, I mean, it falls into that bold category, and it's outside of the box, right? To be learning at every different level, it's engagement, and it's, you know, you can send it up so that it's measurable, the scientific data, and kids learning about the vocabulary of it, the concept of it, the process of it. It's not necessarily in the classroom. You know, so there's but my suggestion, you know, just to recap real quickly would be to suggest possibly to allow teachers um, to submit and to, to get them engaged and think about this as possible. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. We just want to just and great ideas, Kate, and thoughts, yeah, Kate. Right. And thank you, you know, to, to everybody. It's just we have to make sure that it's something that's you and then when you use this term a lot probably moving forward, is it sustainable too? Because the money's gonna dry up eventually and our operating budget is gonna take over. So when we start to shift, you know, dollars to different things, we want to make sure that's what we're shifting towards so our operating budget will fund it mm -hmm. and support it. So, so it's but sustainable. It is, but I think that the point is is that there's there could be an opportunity for a significant paradigm shift. Yeah, shift. Exactly. So, but, yeah. And, and, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah, and not to be bold and, and speaking again, but just to say, kind of it doesn't matter, you know, if, if it is sustainable or not sustainable. It's just like it's going to change how people learn and think and process. And looking forward, it's just like a whole other level of learner and, mm -hmm. and teacher, too, for that part. So. Yep. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, ready, let's see, move on to our last item, which is just a follow up from our previous meeting because we didn't have a mark for action, and that is uh, the, uh, to uh, approve the budget transfers that were presented and discussed at, well, first at FFO and then were discussed at the last uh, um, board meeting. I assume that there's nothing new in there. No. Right? So, so, nope, nothing has changed. Uh, so, just... if anybody doesn't have any questions, uh, uh, Certainly entertain a motion for the approval of the proposed budget transfer as presented. I would like right. to make a motion to approve the proposed budget transfer as presented. Okay. okay. And Eric seconds it. Any, any any further discussion on this item? Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. aye. Anybody oppose? Anybody want Can to Candace is in the meeting too. That. Was that Candace? Candace? That was Candace. Yeah. Oh, she she uh, joined. Candace. She's virtual. Okay, so uh, that is approved. That's the end of our discussion action items for the evening. Um, we have uh, administration reports. Uh, Jeff? Uh, yeah, just a few items. Um, Board of Ed Retreat, we we're trying to, I know we polled and we we're looking at like May 3rd or 4th. We're having some trouble with that date for the full group. Tim and I talked a little bit earlier this afternoon. Um, we're going to maybe re poll for maybe the week after in May, so the second week of May, or the idea of potentially maybe utilizing one of our board meetings, because um, we know, you know, everybody's going to be, would be present, uh, hopefully. So keep, uh, stay tuned for that. We'll send out kind of a repoll um, for that, because that first week isn't, uh, isn't working. Um, second item, I just, I wanted to just bring up the baseball field, because uh, and I've heard from a couple parents, 
Um, you know, that field and, and Chris Lund is on the line. He's been evaluating it, you know, with the maintenance guys. It, it's been an issue for years. Uh, years ago, I think it was maybe 10 years ago, um, they had they had dug, I think it was left field out because it was off kilter. I don't know the whole story. I wasn't here, but um, it's the, the drainage has still been an issue over the years. Um, and it, it hasn't, the drainage has not been addressed. Um, it needs to be completely ripped out the outfield and redone completely. Um, there's an option that we could rip out and sod the whole field for $63,000. But the problem becomes go through the winter, the following year, is it going to grow again appropriately? It doesn't have the base that it needs underneath from what we've, we've found. So we're in a quandary with this field. Uh, you know, we can scrape it down and try and plant grass. That's what we've kind of done each year, but we always get the complaints each year. We just haven't put it into capital. We've been focused on the school projects and everything else. So maybe it's time that we get it into capital or we try and get it, you know, try and get it fixed. Chris Lund, you're on the line. Any anything to add, you know, to that with the field that I'm missing, or I think I'm right on the sixty-three thousand, correct for the sod? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and just like you said, Jeff, and, and clarify that that is only to basically take off the top top layer of the existing uh, grass, that's not to go any deeper. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, you know, and obviously I was here 10 years ago either, but it sounds like there was some work done there. Um, it was dug out and the wrong type of clay was put in, uh, something that's not drainable. There's been some work since to cut drainage paths in there and whatnot, uh, none of which have proven to be successful. So uh, the left field becomes, I, for all intents and purposes, a swamp, and then uh, that extends all the way over to almost in the right center field. Uh, we had a turf specialist come out you know, who used for the other fields to buy sod, and they gave us that quote, and that would do, basically do two thirds of the field from left over to, from left field over to right center, almost to right field itself. Um, but that only buys us a short amount of time. Uh, we had a rough season last year. We don't have irrigation permanently on the field. We had basically no water and no rain precipitation for six weeks, which you know, beat the field up. And then the, the geese took a liking to it this winter. And you know, we're in a really rough position right now. So you know, there are some short-term solutions maybe to make it just playable for this year, but it certainly won't look pretty. Um, and then it was going to get in worse shape. So. I would recommend we find the time and the resources at some point in the near future to finally resolve it. But there's only some ban so many band-aids we can put on it. Thanks, Chris. Happy to put this as an agenda item too yeah, in the future, Eric, but, but Eric, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. So one is thanks to Carter Chambers for writing yeah, the absolutely. letter. And it's funny, I drove by the field yeah, this I took, weekend. I took a look at it too. <laughs> I didn't even know, like I, I, I look, I know it's always bad, but it's, like the it, worst I've ever it, seen. It's, it's, it's gotten so, worse. Um, two things. One like is, like, really in terms of it. the quick fix for this year, can they at least play at Vets Field, or is that not So enough? we are playing at Vets, and we're playing at Bridegroom. Okay, so there's at least, it's we not do home have, field, but, but we it, don't have lights, which is the problem. I know they Neither like the of them have lights. Neither one of no, them have no. lights. Okay. I know it's a big thing for the, the yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. As a baseball mom, yeah, it's, yeah. they are they're they're devastated that they're not here. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to balance yeah. from two fields that yes. you're uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not. It's not your home field. That's, that's right. where you played when you were in Babe Ruth, yeah. and that's yeah. where you played when you were little. League. You come to high school, you want to play varsity on the field. Yeah. And it's just it's hard. So, but, did we? What about turf? So, so it, before we talk, even just before turf, <laughs> is there a problem that the drainage just, it doesn't matter what's on top, because if it doesn't drain, I mean, yeah. turf still needs, you need to set up the ground to allow it, it to drain. Mm -hmm. So you don't, but but it's been a problem for forever. Not for, not forever. Okay. Um, now, when that field was originally put in, when Jeff was in high school, or before Jeff was in high school. <laughs> I remember it was there. It was, it was, like, it was in good shape. It was, it was, um, it was, a, 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 yeah, it was people tell me, award, an award-winning field that was done very, very well. I think, I don't know, this will I'll sound like Jamie, but I think, I think over the many, many years, um, I think there has been neglect, um, yeah. uh, and 
probably the foundation of the field wasn't put in to what we would, if you were to gut it and redo it, yeah. um, as they did at Bridebrook. I mean, Bridebrook fields were done like really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, so um, I think I think I think we, what we should do is just let is is let um, Jeff and and thanks that we've got Chris here uh, to dig into it um, and come back and, and uh, tell us all about it. But um, it's um, there's one other option also is look at do we move the, like, that field either for something else or whatever parking. The parking lot or whatever and we move it somewhere else. So I mean, yep, that's just a, like if if it's just too far gone. Do we look at something else in the upper field or something like that? So I know just just looking for whatever options we you know the when, turf, when, there's moving when, it, when, there's fixing it. When we looked at the turf um for we the, for at the football field we looked yeah. at we looked at the uh we looked at both did you at both yeah, yeah. and uh i tell you they're beautiful it, 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 <laughs> that's for jamie uh, out right i was it's on pretty, that committee and it was they were beautiful but, uh, fields but we just we couldn't even there was no way even look <laughs> we at it we were like nope yeah. <laughs> but i don't know maybe that's something should be should be considered because i think there's different options with turf turf and there are huge options there are. you don't have to all in no you're right yep. Off. Yep. But, but i have to say that the field was hard to sell yes without yeah. but the sad reality is no matter yeah. what we're doing it's not going to affect them. no no that's, that's right right it's, it's, not gonna it. it's not so, going to fix it it's not going to fix it for them that. no so unless the, you saw harder is thank you for looking out for the future yes. is what we yeah harder and yeah then, but you know we um, We've done this every year, you know, and now it's getting worse as, as yeah. we go. It sure yeah. looks like the geese really nailed it. They were the, every year they're bad. We tried, you know, putting that there was a statue out that there, that a wolf plastic set. <laughs> they kill work. it. Uh, and yeah, it, they make a mess of it. Um, and not having, as Chris said, not having the rain for six weeks, yeah. it's just, it's not catching and growing. Yeah, even there's even no, if we did spend the six, there's no way they're going to get that done before the. Play. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's an I mean last game. you can scrape it down and try and overseed it to see if you get some grass to yeah, sell, but, but I, don't, I don't know. All that baby grass. Okay. Yeah. All right. so, so anyway, so we'll look forward to hearing uh, your your magical solution on yeah. this one. But between that, I just want to say for the record, though, <laughs> between between the, between that and the South Gym, I crawl out of my skin when yeah. I walk by the South Gym every time <laughs> looking. We we've, we've got to get that addressed, and that's you know, it is. The, it's all baseball feels like the first thing you see when you come. It is. Yeah, yeah, that's true right too. The other Bill, the, you know, <laughs> we 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 yeah. The, the, the kids, the families are right. out, so. Yeah, Doug, the, the, nice. the, the back great job on those <laughs> Fencing's nice, all you know, fencing for the most part. But so we'll keep we'll we'll keep working on it. But I do appreciate Carter as well, you know, reaching out, and we've heard some from some other parents too. Yeah, so from parents yeah, so um, so that's the baseball. Uh, April twenty sixth, we'll bring uh, Deb Kelly and uh, myself and company will bring um, some graduation recommendations for dates. Um, to everyone, you know, we kind of gone back and forth. Bottom line, you know, we, we need to have it outside. There isn't an, an inside option. So we need some rain dates um, to be able to have, you know, the one ceremony. So I know that the uh, grad party is trying to work on some dates too, but, you know, we can't lock in, you know, a, a date for, for the, nor can we do for they the middle very, school. very, very anxious. Yeah, so that, that's a bit of a problem because, you know, we can't just have the alternative at the last minute and go inside. That's just not gonna happen. So. Well, we're still trying to work through that. We'll bring the recommendations to the 26. Um, and then uh, that's a, that, that's all I, that's pretty much all I have. Cool. Amy? Um, I have a July camp date. Ooh. All right. I'm going to give you an update from the last time. So the last time we were together, my total number was at 389 students who were virtual learners. We are down to 296. Nice. Wow. wow. So our elementaries moved from at the last meeting, they were at 110, they're now down to 95. Our middle school was at 120 last meeting, they are down to 86. Wow. Yep, and then our high school was at 159 last meeting and we are down to 160. Nice. So um, as I mentioned in the last meeting, we still have sort of a consistent cohort that just isn't comfortable with their kids coming back to school until after the April vacation. So I have a feeling next meeting you'll see Difference. quite a quite a decrease in some um, coming back. So and then I know the announcement of the vaccine for the 16 and 17 year olds is also playing into some families' decisions as well. 
Um, and then the only other update I wanted to give you is we are starting this week the closure and silver lining <laughs> messaging across the district in the sense that I have had four administrative colleagues, Mariana being one of them, who has been working with me on sort of promoting a once a week message across the district on celebrating what has been accomplished, uh, even laughing a little bit in regards to just artifacts. <laughs> Mr. Kidd actually is with his, his, his uh, social studies teacher background is helping dig out artifacts from the last year, messages we sent, decisions we've had to make, and just <laughs> like put them out there as just sort of this every Thursday 60 second update, we're calling it, where we just highlight a different couple employment groups every week, acknowledge what they've done, and focus on the students and what they've accomplished, and just keeping it positive as a means of from now through June, every week sending one out every Thursday is just a means of just providing some closure and some celebratory sort of positive, funny. I mean, some of us even were talking about that. If you just search your cell phone, or the pictures you saved over the course of the last year that would probably tell the, tell the story but um so we're going to be starting on the thursday and then the biggest piece that we're doing is in june the last two weeks is one of the things that i'll be asking staff for is artifacts from them and then we're going to actually set all the pictures and artifacts um to music as a means of closure for the end of the year and we'll play that over the course of two weeks and then we're trying to come up with some good closure activities for the staff as well. So just trying to keep it sort of, you know, this is the first week of students back five days. And so we thought this was a good week to sort of start that weekly habit, if you will, um, and sort of acknowledge that. So that's when they come off this Thursday. But I mean, our kids are back. That's our biggest update. <laughs> it's a big deal. Yes, it, <laughs> it feels really yeah, good. Yeah, it is. So they're back. Yeah. So. Excellent, excellent. Okay, Marianne, I... Sure, I have, when you guys leave, I have budget books for you guys. I just, um, I didn't put that one in there because it's so thick and really nothing to change from what you have. In terms of, I probably should have put the summary sheet in there for you guys, but my apologies, I didn't. Okay. Um, so what you'll have is pretty much basically what you have in your budget book, except the object summary. I put a description by, you know, like salary to kind of explain what the differences were for each of the categories. Well, good. And every board of finance member has yeah. one of those. Yeah. They receive their copies. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Committee reports. Let's see. I guess we did. There was an FFO meeting since the last quarter. Right? Yeah, the most of it was. It, yeah, I think we just covered. We covered it. In we pretty slot, much. Yeah, so yeah. Was, yeah, I think that's what we covered. That's yeah. what we talked about. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so that brings us up to. We board. had we had a personnel policy committee meeting on Wednesday, Thursday. Last. Uh, yeah. Wednesday or Thursday? I don't know. The 31st, whatever mm -hmm. date that whatever day the week that yeah. was. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, I Wednesday or Thursday. I have no idea. I just know we had one last week and yeah. we have a policy meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Okay. So that brings us to board comments and future agenda topics. 
Um, anybody have a comment or oh, Eric? So with um, Connecticut now dropping where 16 year 16 and 17 year olds, and 18 year olds, I guess, 19 year olds, whatever, can get vaccinated. And then in theory, there's a chance, I guess, even before the school year, yeah. maybe yeah. the 12 to 15. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in just either from is it from the public, I don't know, it's like I'm not sure who, but does that change anything for us? But that was a um, question too. And it's it's gonna be really odd because you might have half the high school back yeah. and half not, uh, elementary schools none. You know, when you start getting but but anyway, it'd be interesting to get somebody to just tell us what are they even thinking about. I, I don't don't know, but I'd be interested in what they're thinking about what can we do differently, what can't we do. You know, I mean it can go in so many different directions, but I'd just be interested in like what are the people who are who do this for a living, what are they what are they thinking about for uh, school? Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be good. Yep. Jamie? So mine was similar to that, but it was about reporting it. Are, do we know if they are going to make, I don't even know if there's thoughts uh, to making the vaccine mandatory for the student population once it becomes rolled out and reporting that to nurses, to school nurses. I mean, I don't even know now it's not mandatory, but yeah. are we requiring parents to report the vaccine to the school nurses as part of their physicals? Uh, all to be, I think, determined. You okay. know, there's a lot of red tape with that, and I think there's a lot of talk, you know, at the state level. Just because I know so. when I do my kids' physical every yeah. year, I have to give them the immunization report yeah. along with it. Yep. yep. Um, well, I mean, whether this becomes a yearly vaccine too, well, that, which it, I mean, it could become. That flu shot, my doctor. Yeah, the like flu the flu shot, shot that they get every year on their vaccination yep. report. Yeah. So I guess my question is, is well, one, because your primary care physician isn't giving the vaccine, um, how or what if that? Is going to come up. I yeah. haven't heard anything in any of my paid stuff. John, have you heard anything? No, it's yeah. legal to require. Well, well, no. Well, because we require certain vaccines unless we have a religious exemption now. Th that's what ties right. into that. Yeah, it's, it's still in play. It's, it's, it's well, some colleges, colleges are. are yeah, that's, not. that's oh. what they're talking about doing. So, yeah, I think. Yeah. Right, but to see, that's what I'm saying. Like, so we it have all, to. It all moves, but so I was just thinking of policy. Yeah, some more discussions about yeah, yeah. vaccine and yeah. And if and we're even gonna, like, so my son's getting his first one on Thursday. Do I have to tell the nurse he's gotten dose one? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, is we can't. Yeah, that's something reporting? like we can't. We can't mandate. I know you we can't could ask. It, but through... is it something that we're going to encourage parents to let the school know your kid's been vaccinated or not? Well, it will come out if they ever have to quarantine, because then we are able to ask the question just like with staff, okay, you know, you but we, we, we are not asking staff, you know, to tell us. We did survey, but, you know, only not even 300 participants, you know, were part of the survey to tell us whether or not they. I know, you know we can't name data, data, but I just didn't know if it's something you would are encouraging parents to tell the schools that they have been or not. I, I mean, yeah, I think we, we want to try and get encouraged to of, let us know. So but what, is it 16 and over? So we have. Yeah quite a bit of high school students. Yep. I don't know how many parents yep. are getting them for their kids, but. Yeah, I think it will truly come out though if they have to end up quarantining. That's when we ask the question, they say, yep, oh, I'm fully vaccinated. And then they don't, we just, then we'll have to get proof though of you vaccination. Know, vaccination. So okay. it's gonna become a little bit more, but by time, that time, you know, we're close to the end of the year, and, but okay. it's gonna run into next year, probably yep. for sure, so. So then my second thing is, is Miracle Week, for those of you who weren't here last week, or last meeting, we are, so, so our cup that runneth over with how many kids and families we have signed up for Little League, uh, lacrosse, field hockey, kickball, basketball, dance. Um, and soon we're going to be doing the I Can Bike and the Kayak. It, it's amazing. We've got families from Madison to Preston to Ledger. Just so excited. And we have so many towns and stuff just volunteers it's just amazing and it's so incredible to see um but if anybody wants to volunteer we are still looking for volunteers um and then we are going to be making a go for oyster fest 
Oh. Um, we're not going to do it the same time as we've been usually been doing it with the vintage market, but the vintage market is going to be the 20th. We are going to make a go for it on 925, September 25th from 12 to 6. So we're gonna we're gonna try. Good, good. So Excellent. We're okay. very excited and we're ramping up for that. Good, good. Anybody else? Barry? Two quick comments. Yeah. One, uh, as looking at the discussions coming up for the board retreat, yeah. The idea of, of going beyond that discussion of a five year plan. Mm -hmm. I looked into some of the research on that, and it's really mixed uh, in the most cases five year plans. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is window dressing, they really are not that effective. There are a few instances where they are because of special circumstances that. Uh, do that. So there are better options out there for that. So before we automatically jump into a five-year plan discussion, uh, I'd like to have a discussion of, you know, is that is this the best way to go, or is there a better way on a more shorter uh, time frame? You know, if you look at this, say, I, we never could have predicted the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, the think five years in the future is very, very hard. Yep. Yes, you know, you know, yeah. I'd like to have us not automatically jump into a five year planning cycle without having these discussions of where the best, the best way Good. to go. Yeah, no, by, yep. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, talk about uh, Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've seen was uh, situation I involved. I couldn't answer this, so I just wanted to bring it up for consideration. I went to these kids that are in the uh, geometry program at the middle school. They've been isolated there because of maintaining the full force hope. Now that the high school is opening up to uh, athletics and in person and whatever, oh. uh, is there uh, considerations for allowing the middle school students in the geometry program to participate in person of the high school? Because the, the way that is unfolding for them has been not ideal for them. Good question. I couldn't answer the question as to why the high school is moving in that way, why the middle school students couldn't participate in person at high school. Yeah, send them my way or Jason Bickard's way. I and mean, we've talked to one uh, one parent. Um, Jason might have talked to more than one. But definitely, yeah, we're, we're happy to talk further about okay. some of the next steps good. for that. Very yep. good. Excellent, Barry. Anybody else? I had one. I had one. Oops. I had one, which is um, would it be possible for Deb Kelly to share with us at our next meeting? Um, Prior to our board retreat, the, the current thinking on the graduate profile. Yeah, the high school. profile the graduate. Yeah, I think that that's a that's some information I'd like to get re re engaged into board members uh, heads uh, prior to uh, wherever we're going to go with our with our retreat. But I think that that's a that's a good piece of information to have. I'll talk to her. Yeah, yeah if, if it's possible. If it's not, if it's got too many other things going on. I, I feel so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is she nodding? Yeah, I can't we can, we can see her. There. Yeah, she's she's <laughs> okay, good. And then Tim, I think Kate has her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Kate. Oh, just, just real quick, um, two things. One is um, I like the idea of consent agendas. I like how we have that. I do not have the rules for a larger meeting that involves consent agenda. And so rather than having long meetings, four or five hour meetings, it would be like an hour meeting. It's not necessary for all of us to kind of question, I guess, and process a lot of what's discussed. If it's presented and then we can take it off the consent agenda and just move to the topic more quickly, that's kind of what I would uh, suggest. And maybe it's part of what our board retreat might cover. And then the other one is that I've heard from some people in our town where they don't understand why our board meetings start at five when a lot of people don't really have access and can't really attend. And yeah, can we go back? I know that they're recorded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they are available. That I, I have heard this on a couple of occasions. But yep. I think yeah. I'd be advised to 
Jeff, Jeff and I, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, we, that, that's a, yeah, we're talking about that. And we're also yeah. talking about public comment. As yeah, well, exactly. To figure out how to get that different. Yeah, now that we know that this will work, that was, we, yeah. we, we've had three, I mean, we had some technical difficulties uh, tonight, but uh, but it worked. I mean, we were using one computer, but yeah, Tim and I will we'll talk about those. Good suggestions. Yep. Go yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, I fully, fully it appreciate five that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Everybody good? Yeah. Uh, what was that? What's that leave us with? That leaves. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll oh. second. Yes, Candace. Thank you, Candace. Wow. Hey, Barry, can you okay. not run out? I just want to talk to you. We are adjourned. <laughs>